Order of the President and Board of Trustees, roll call. Trustee Rasich. Here. Trustee Wojcicki. Here. Trustee Benucci. Here. Trustee Lamb. Here. Trustee O'Rourke. Here. Trustee Peck. Here. Mayor Collins. Here. If we could rise for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. We're seeking a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting, committee of the whole <coughs> workshop, and executive session held on July 11th. So, so moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. Presidential comments? I have none. Trustees' comments? If there are no trustee comments, this would be the time for public comments. If there are no public comments, then we'll proceed with the workshop meeting. First item on the agenda is IMS pavement condition and management. Actually, this evening we have two items that are related to uh, public works, and they're actually directly related to the village's strategic plan. So these are items that the board has uh, talked about, has gotten input from the public too as well, and has taken back and been incorporated as part of the village's strategic plan as a whole. We felt like tonight would be a good opportunity to talk about two of these items and then feel free to have an interactive discussion with the two different presenters and uh, ask those questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott to do a little introduction as to uh, the IMS process and pavement evaluation. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Board of Trustees. Uh, first presentation tonight will be from uh, IMS. Um, they will be um, giving a brief presentation on uh, the pavement condition ma um, management and uh, survey. Uh, if you remember, I know some of you were around in 2011 when we had done this uh, initially, and uh, they had done a complete survey of the entire roadway network within the village, and then each roadway was giving a numeric value between zero and 100, uh, signifying the uh, condition of the, uh, the roadway. Um, Back in 2011, uh, we had a uh, uh, overall score of an 80 for our roadway network, which, which was good, but uh, I get, uh, that was in 2011, so it's been five years since then, so we thought it'd be a, a good time to revisit the survey and have IMS um, give a, a brief uh, presentation on their, uh, their services, and uh, we'll be open for any questions after that. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Don Hart with IMS. Uh, I'm here with Dave Butler. Dave is our Chief Pavement Management Engineer and the designated project manager for the project. Uh, he was instrumental in the development of the program the first time around for the village. What we thought we'd do tonight is briefly go over the concept of pavement management, sort of an overview of what you had and what pavement management is and then have Dave talk a little bit about what was done back in 2011 as far as the number of roads and the score, and then finish it up with just a one slide uh, scope of services that is proposed for this year's update. So with that, uh, just a little bit about IMS for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We're a pavement man. We've been doing this unique <clears throat> type of engineering service for over 40 years. We work, uh, we started in the Chicago metro area. We now work throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, so we have a lot of experience here in the Chicago metro area, specifically with the village of Plainfield and surrounding communities. We are a, a software developer as well as a data, collecting, uh, data collection firm. And if down the road you select to go with uh, an enterprise-wide pavement management system or some other pavement management system, we would be able to help you move the, the um, information that you have from the proposed and existing PavePro manager system to whatever system you may want to go with. We, we work with all the different systems. Um, we have our own data collection equipment. Uh, and we do not only pavement, but right away asset management, but we're focused in those areas. 
with a high priority, 98, 99% of our work for governmental agencies, primarily cities and counties. Um, with that kind of experience, though, we realize that we're providing a service, and service is the most important thing, and we, we try to always remember that when performing our services for our clients. Um, if we can go to the next one. This basically is give you a quick overview of some of the projects we, we've done over the years uh, in the Chicago metro area. Uh, you can see Plainfield circled down at the bottom. They're not all uh, dotted. We've done a lot more projects than that. But you can see we have a, a comprehensive knowledge of roadway systems in the area, what types of rehabilitation strategies are successfully used, and a variety of different things. Our software programs and the ones that you have existing have been developed over the years with input from the clients saying, gee, we'd like our pavement management program to include this feature or give us this information. And those changes have been included. So although we may have started with a pure engineering pavement management program, it has evolved over the years uh, with input from the clients as what they wanted to see in a pavement management program. Uh, the approach, if you click again, uh, in developing a pavement management program is to work with the village to confirm, in this case, the current uh, objectives, policies, and budgets of the village. We worked with you initially, but things may have changed over the last five years. So we'll reconfirm that as we develop uh, an update system. Once we've done that, we'll confirm the data collection survey methodology that's necessary to achieve that information. We'll get the uh, data from the field, run it through an analysis program, uh, connect everything to GIS, we live in a GIS world, run it through the software program, conduct training uh, with village staff, update the software and, and uh, generate a, a report through the pavement management program so it can provide the information and we run full circle providing the information that the village may need. Every um, municipality is different. You have unique features and those change from time to time. So how you treat crosswalks and curb and gutter and different rehabilitation strategies are all considered so that the pavement management program is individualized to your particular needs here in, in Plainfield. Uh, what we propose to do is perform a surface condition survey. We will be using the laser road surface tester to perform that activity. And it's a uh, vehicle that is a th operated by a three-man crew. Uh, it, it, it has very elaborate GPS and inertial navigation system. All the data that we collect is GPS referenced. The inertial navigation system takes over if we're driving under trees or under a viaduct or some urban can canyon issue where we lose satellite lock. The inertial navigation system takes over, keeps track of exactly where the vehicle was. We run the, the uh, vehicle down the roadway usually single direction testing on your uh, residential streets, two direction testing on your arterials and collectors. The unique features of this van is it has a very accurate distance measuring device, but along this front bumper here, there are 11 lasers that help us uh, do a variety of different data collection activities. Primarily, they're good at counting cracks, classifying them by width and depth categories, uh, performing uh, measurements of roughness, longitudinal roughness down the pavement, and then also doing a rutting survey. Inside the van, the person sitting on the right side of the vehicle has a touch screen control panel and he is inputting um, different types of distresses into a uh, a touchpad and a rating a variety of different uh, distresses as to their severity and extent. We also have uh, a minimum of three high definition uh, digital cam cameras, all GPS referenced, and 
we use those three in combination to perform a moving survey. We're not stopping. We're not having any of our people out on the street, and we're not stopping traffic. So it moves uh, with traffic and collects information related to surface condition and gives us the ability as post-processing activities to possibly down the road do right away asset surveys and a variety of different information if you so choose. In summary, if you do the next one, you can see that the laser, um, it, uh, the lasers are used for roughness, rutting, and cracking. It is a continuous survey. We're not using sample units. We will be using the um, intervals that were used last time around. We summarize data on a block-to-block -block basis, intersection to intersection. That's usually the type of survey length that you would repair streets on, so it's very useful. And then all that gets linked to the GIS. The three-man crew is not asked to make um, conclusions. They are just asked to record data. The data then goes in and is analyzed, and we're not asking a single person to say, gee, on a zero to 10 basis, what is that number? So it's not subjective in that way in any way. And it complies with ASTM uh, standards, D6433 uh, D industry standards. Uh, the way the laser works, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's just a very accurate distance measuring device. There's 11 of them. They operate at uh, measurements at 32,000 times per second. They have a measuring accuracy of eight one thousandths of an inch. And what it does is it shoots a laser beam onto the pavement. It's reflected back into the camera. And through triangulation, it's just a very accurate distance measuring device. Any movement in the vehicle is factored out through the accelerometer. And what this allows us to do is determine the texture of the pavement. And by knowing the texture of the pavement, the lasers can then differentiate what's a crack versus what is texture. So we do macro texture first, then it has the ability, and we're the only ones in the industry that do it, to measure and count cracks, classifying them into width and depth categories. Uh, it also measures longitudinal roughness. We convert that into the International Roughness Index, and it uh, measures rutting. So it's all done at a moving operation. It also, <clears throat> um, through the touch screen and the third person sitting in the right side of the, the vehicle, allows us to collect a whole variety of distresses. These are the types that are easy to see and record um, not like cracks. If we have a crack and it's a transverse crack even at a slow speed, as you go over that crack trying to count that, it disappears in a, in a split second. So the lasers do a very good job on that. And things we can see and record, we do that through the touch screen operation. If you... So the vehicle's driving down your street, it's collecting all the pavement data. It is also taking uh, a variety of high-resolution uh, digital images. Everything's uh, GPS referenced, including each frame uh, of all the multiple cameras. So if you click it one more time, you can see that everything is referenced, uh, and it, we're doing a complete assessment of the roadway, but some of these um, images that they will be a deliverable, but they can also be used down the road to collect right away data information if you so choose. Um, if you go on, the vehicle is set up with um, one, uh, numbers one, two, and three as the minimum camera configurations and views. We can add multiple cameras to collect whatever kind of information we want. We're getting these views from those cameras. If you click it, please. Uh, we use that for pavement data. Uh, we also use it for quality control. JPEG deliverables are part of uh, what we're going to be providing to you at 25-foot intervals, so you can actually drive the pavement from your own computers. And um, it gives us the option down the road 
to be able to provide you with right away asset information without having to redrive the road if you so choose. Digital images are like this. These are actually stitched together at 25 foot intervals. At 25 in foot intervals, you don't miss anything. Uh, so you can drive the streets and look at them. You can also take individual images, bring them to a board meeting or uh, a meeting with special interest groups or whatever you may need, and use these uh, for a variety of different issues. Um, as I said, we found that 25 intervals, 25 foot intervals don't miss anything. Uh, everything's linked to the GIS. Um, it will uh, show GPS references and distance into a section. There's multiple views um, and it provides a good point in time record, not only for normal engineering issues here in the village, but if there was ever a natural disaster, you'd have a point in time record that you could deal with FEMA and things like that to show what the conditions were at, at that particular point in time. So in summary, uh, the surface condition survey portion of the project, it's objective and repeatable. We do continuous uh, measurements, not just take sample units. It's a three-prong approach. We use the lasers for what we can't see or collect very easily. We use the visual portion and the touch screen for what is easily seen. And we use the video for what is visible but difficult to record in real time. So we combine those three elements together, GPS reference everything, it's configurable and adjustable to meet any unique needs that the village has, and um, it's safe and doesn't provide for any traffic related issues. There is uh, one other part of the data collection activity and that's uh, the deflection survey. Although the program can work with or without uh, deflection, most of the Chicago metro area agencies do include deflection analysis with their surveys, either on the entire system or on those, that part of the road network that has heavy loads, usually your arterial and, and collector system. That is what the Village of Plainfield did the first time around. We evaluated your entire street network with the laser road surface tester and then also did um, deflection analysis on your, entire, your arterial and collector network. For this activity, truck goes along at slow speeds but has to stop for about 30 seconds and it actually thumps the pavement. There's, it comes down and it applies a thousand pound load to the pavement at eight times per second totally non-destructive, but gives us a lot of information. So if we look, it'll develop a deflection basin. We're measuring deflection at five locations away from the load. It tells us a lot about how that pavement's going to perform in the future and if any problems exist or its ability to carry different types of loads. If you go on, um, next slide. Uh, we also do something a little bit different in, in going beyond what I just said. We also do a layered analysis so we can determine the condition of the base course, the condition of the subgrade, and, and more readily identify any problems that exist. By knowing where the problem occurs, you can more accurately um, decide on an appropriate rehabilitation strategy to collect that or address the, that problem and correct the problem. So we're going to take all this data and we can put it into any one of a number of pavement management programs. Most com comprehensive one out there is PavePro Manager. It was developed by IMS many years ago. I talked about it a little bit earlier. That's the one that you have and we propose to put the data in there. If down the road <clears throat> you want to go a different way in, in lieu of uh, uh, having your own software program. If you just want to report in a spreadsheet, we can do that. If you want to go into a, an enterprise-wide management system with a pavement management module that's slightly different, we can take this comprehensive data and load it into a new system and have it work all within that uh, enterprise-wide system. But those are options for you. This is what we're proposing to do. 
with whatever approach we take to do the analysis, we will be using the same methodology that we used in 2011. Uh, what we're trying to do is determine the condition for each roadway section. Um, if this is condition and this is time, we know that a pavement starts out in excellent condition when it's brand new and over time it starts to deteriorate and move forward. It's pretty flat up at the top for the first number of years and then once it starts to uh, deteriorate, it deteriorates in a more rapid pace. So what we try to do is collect or identify this point and implement a rehabilitation strategy there. We can do it much less expensively here than if we wait a few years and, do, and be forced into a reconstruction. So we're trying to optimize uh, the best time and strategy uh, for your decision making process, save you the money, give you the biggest bang for the buck. And it's really a guide to help your staff make those kinds of decisions. They're, they're getting more information to be able to do that. Uh, and then with that, so if you, you implement a rehabilitation strategy, maintenance activity, or pavement preser preservation activity, it goes back up and starts to decline over years. And then when it hits a, another point, it go, you do a rehabilitation strategy and it, it continues on like that. But you realize it never gets up to the point that it started at without rebuilding the roadway. So, but it's a, a good approach to keep a good, useful roadway system. And I think there's just a couple more slides. We will, as part of the deliverable, uh, the analysis and report lets you know what your street inventory is. Uh, in other words, what do you have? What condition is it in? How is it going to perform in the future? and then develop a multi-year plan, usually in five-year intervals, of what to do, when to do it, how much is it going to cost, and where will I be as a result of it. So that you can develop multi-year um, needs assessments, develop uh, funding strategies to bring it up to different levels, understand quickly and easily that if you had to cut the budget or if you get more money, what the ramifications of, of that funding change would be. And uh, staff has, will have more information to provide that because they'll have these tools in place. And it, it comes up with a, uh, a variety of different report generations to help you address it. And if there's changes, if the price of asphalt goes up because of oil changes or whatever it may be, you can click in the new numbers and instantly update the program to reflect whatever economic environment or material cost environment we happen to be in at that time. That basically um, takes care of, of the an analysis part. As I said earlier, we live in a GIS world. We've, we'll link everything to the GIS and you'll be able to um, use the GIS to access information, but more importantly, if you click again, to use it as a reporting tool to work, uh, make presentations to the board, to special interest groups, to other departments so that you're not um, possibly overlaying a road and maybe another department is saying, well, we want to build a, a water main or, or whatever it might be and have to tear it up. So there's many different uses. You can show the existing condition, what your plans are, your yearly plans, and what you plan to do. There are a variety of different uses within the GIS environment. And then the last couple is we will be delivering um, right away images for you. Um, that's part of that 25-foot image deliverable, everything GPS reference. What that does is it gives you the ability down the road, if you ever wanted to expand and do ADA ramps or sidewalks or striping or signs or tr trees, storm in inlets, whatever it might be, um, we can extract that information off the GPS referenced video 
and not have to go out and redrive your 300 mile network. So it would be a big cost savings. It doesn't have to be done now, it could be done in the future, but that's one of the benefits of using the RST. In a, there's no additional cost for it, but it gives you options down the road. And what then you could do is just simply point and click on any feature and if you uh, advance it, it gives you information on whatever one you picked. If you're looking for sign inventories or if you click it again, maybe um, sidewalks or um, ADA ramps, what, whatever it is, you'd be able to g gather that information for different types of inventory and condition assessments. Uh, I, oh, and if, if you needed a compliance survey where you actually had to know really detailed information on ADA compliance instead of just a general inventory or sidewalk compliance, we can also perform that, those services now. We didn't have that ability five years ago, but we can actually drive the sidewalks and measure all different kinds of information to see if you are in fact compliant with that. So with that, uh, I'd just like to make the close. It's basically we're providing a tool for staff to be able to give them information they need to answer your questions, to um, come up with uh, the best and most practical rehabilitation activities to maintain your road roadway at the highest level within the budgets that are provided. Um, we have a whole bunch of experience to do that and uh, we're looking to upgrade your system so that you can continually have that ability. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave. Just He's got two slides just to briefly tell you what we did last time around and we'll show the scope of service. Well, what's proposed for, for what we're proposing for the update is to perform a project initiation using the same intervals of testing that we did in 2011 plus add new streets that weren't there in 2011 or weren't tested because subdivisions weren't done. Um, we'll do set up the appropriate stationing for your current road network. Uh, we'll perform a RST surface condition survey. We'll do deflection testing on your arterials and collectors again. Um, GP, every, we'll provide GPS reference, digital video, and digital images. Uh, we'll do the necessary data processing, link everything to the GIS, and uh, perform all the information into a software update, including your 2011 data that has been updated in-house with the different strategies that were done and or rehabilitations that were done between 2011 and now. And then um, put it all into the program, provide on-site training and go through it, work with staff to generate whatever level of report generation is appropriate to meet the needs of the village. So uh, Dave has just two slides. Okay. He can finish up. Um, the testing that was done, the testing that was done in 2011, um, we tested a total of 297 miles in the village, and uh, 13 miles of those were arterial. Uh, 24 miles were collector roads. Uh, we did most of the arterials and collectors in two directions. The local roads comprised uh, 260 miles, and those were done with a single pass of the laser road surface tester. Um, the arterials and collectors, a lot of those were uh, also had deflection testing on them in 2011. So we had that additional structural testing for, for uh, 50 miles, I believe, of those of those uh, uh, 260 or uh, of the 297 total. In addition to that, uh, the village of Plainfield is divided up into a myriad of neighborhoods, and we uh, once we got all the roadway. Uh, information into the GIS, we were able to again link the neighborhoods to the local roads so you can filter and, and order um, the roads by, by neighborhood if you, if you so choose. That was kind of a big effort. I didn't realize there were so many neighborhoods in, 
in Plainfield. Uh, I think there were 83 that we did. You probably have a lot more now. So anyway, that was a, a kind of a, an interest. Um, let's see, the, the condition of the roadways are, sh uh, this is the way they were as, as tested, uh, nearly, as was stated before, nearly an 80 average condition, which is, which is excellent. That's a, a very good uh, pavement condition score to have on average for, for a village. Um, a lot of that is due to the fact that you have pretty new streets, and so um, you probably can't expect to maintain that too, too long over time unless you have a, a major effort at rehabilitation. But you can see kind of the distribution uh, from very poor to, to excellent. Uh, it, it's not a normal distribution. It's very skewed towards the, uh, towards the excellent side, which is a good thing to have happen. So um, this time around, we'll be testing them all again and develop a similar a similar uh, set of data so that we can see where we are now. And you'll be able to compare 2011 to 2016 as we go through and do this comparison. So I think that's about all we wanted to show you uh, tonight. Uh, um, with that, the next slide just, I think, shows questions. So, so if there are any questions, please we'd be happy to entertain whatever. You have to use a mic, though, sir. Okay. Sorry. I had a couple of questions. Uh, first, I'd like to say very good, very good presentation, very thorough, and uh, it's a lot of lot of information in there. Um, on the deflection, do you recommend the deflection to be used in the same areas as you had before, or does that last for a number of period or a number of years? You can prorate the the level of the roadway and use the deflection in new areas, or would you recommend doing them the same ones? I would recommend do doing them in the same areas. Okay. The, the deflection information is probably even more volatile than surface information uh, because things happen. The uh, weather is primarily the biggest concern that uh, kind of, if you, you know, you have a wet year and your subgrades and everything are changing. And uh, uh, along with our, our winters, you, you all know how it is, cold winter, warm winter and everything changes, the, the structure of the pavement. So it's important to, to test those repeatedly and uh, to be able to, to get some kind of comparison. I, I wouldn't depend on deflection data to last more than five years. That's, that's hoping a lot. Well, that's the lifespan of the, d the data? Is the data's got a shelf life of about, that's about it. That's about all you can depend on. All right, so we, if we were to do the deflection again, we couldn't necessarily compare it to the one five years ago, right? You just well, a fresh set of data. And you can you in there. general, but you know, it's again, it's uh, it's uh, a very general thing because on a on a specific street, it's not likely that you can get a good comparison. But uh, but overall, you know, if you're looking at uh, a whole sector or a, a large piece of the village, compared comparing that before and after, yeah, you can probably get some useful information out of that. And I had one for Scott. We uh, were the cracks that were counted last time. Was that information useful to the village and the um, the strategy we used to resurface the roadways? And uh, yeah, it was it was actually very helpful. Um, part of the uh, part of counting the number of cracks um, that goes into term to determining the actual pavement condition index number. So if there were a lot of a, a lot of cracks that they observed on the road, that would e e that would have lowered the pavement condition number. And that would have um, actually increased its uh, prioritization on our on our five-year plan as far as a resurfacing or maintenance activity on that roadway. I think the uh, the the uh, point in time pictures also are very very helpful. If there was a ever God forbid another disaster in the area here, to have for insurance companies and the citizens alike would probably be able to get access to that I would guess right we had an interesting experience in Florida uh, w we tested and about a month later uh, a hurricane came through the the county that we happened to be doing and and they found it invaluable I mean they they used it to the, it, the hurricane pretty well knocked down all the public vegetation that that was expensive and hard to do and they they were able to recoup a lot of money for that and get it get it restored the way it was so it was a good thing for them. But we've had s similar um, experiences like that. Uh, uh, pretty much almost every client that has the images finds a, a good use for them that way. 
Well, I, 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 I'd like to give my support for the for the project. I think it's a, I'm very interested to see the comparisons and on how the roadways have declined, and I think it gives it gives us a better vision on what we need to either save for or fix right away. I have a few questions. Uh, uh, you got two different techniques: the uh, visual one and the um, the uh, deflection one. Uh, which one weighs more heavily in your computer program to come up with a number like 79? Um, they're about equal. The deflection has a little bit more weighting than the surface testing um, where the deflection is done, but it's about like 65, 30, well, no, it's 60, 40, roughly. So. But they're both, both very important. Do only a surface condition survey um, <clears throat> for gas B reporting and different things like that. That um, they recommend surface condition surveys updated every used to be one or two. But when you're adding deflection, by they're both important. Uh, you use surface only uh, without deflection. The big difference is you have to wait for the problem to come up to the surface to identify it. Deflection allows you to catch it sometimes before it gets to that point where it's allowing additional intrusion of water and, of course, more rapid. And deflection is the only way to get the uh, substrate data, right? That you talked about the layering. Right. The laser, the the surface tester, it, it can only rate what what it can see on the surface, right? The, some of the distresses are considered to be indicators of what's happening. You see alligator cracking. That's really when it. Very bad roadways usually. That's an indication of problem. Two exceptions, but that's generally an indication. There are certain types of surface distresses that are indicators of base problem. And if we don't have deflection, those indicators as part of developing. Oh, from, I was around in 2011, so I'm interested in seeing your uh, updates and so on. I'm a supporter, a big supporter of the uh, deflection. The question is, I guess in my mind, do we do enough of it? Um, it provides, I think, you know, some more in-depth information. Uh, maybe some of our roads, uh, well, the village does a pretty good job of building the roads to a certain substrate. You know, it's what, we're above, above the normal standards, I think, aren't we? Do we so we shouldn't. We shouldn't yeah, have too big a problem if we, because uh, we we are pretty solid. Did we pick up anything last time? The deflection that said our substrates were not what they should have been. You know, there weren't too many areas that were unusual, but um, there's always that chance out in a subdivision where you might have a softer base, and it may not necessarily mean that the base is bad for a roadway, but. Other areas are going to have stronger bases, and that helps factor into the number, too, as far as well as uh, resurfacing is concerned in the future to take it into consideration. So we would recommend that that be part of the study, too, as well. Now one of the things we do is we um, seal the cracks pretty much every year. Is that beneficial in, as a general rule from your point of view? Crack sealing is very important. Um, I'm a strong proponent of that, and, and uh, um, that's a good thing to do. It keeps the water out of the pavement. Water is the worst enemy of, of pavement, and if you can keep that out, then you're, you're doing well. Um, uh, once a, you, know, I, you can only seal cracks so long. If they get bigger than a certain size, then the sealing does no good after that. So it, it is something you can do, but it kind of has limit, limited benefit. Uh, the proposal that we're, we haven't approved it yet, have we? Okay. 
Uh, we're not talking about doing sidewalks, are we? No, at this point, I know it's a new service that's provided, and, and this is a great, great provider. Um, I, I believe at this point for this season, well, definitely this season and the coming uh, one or two seasons, that we'll continue to use our interns to evaluate the sidewalks and do a, a walking program also linked into the GIS. Uh, they will pick up the sidewalks as far as asset management uh, with the cameras, so we could come back and revisit some areas. So they, they could actually complement each other. I don't know if we're to the point right now um, where we're ready to do sidewalk surveys with the ATV ve vehicle that was provided, but again, that would be at the board's discretion. Our recommendation is to do the uh, roadway pavement evaluation, pick up the other assets that are out there too as well, and then make some decisions from there. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. Uh, I think we definitely have to do the roads because last time we did it, we ended up putting what another million dollars into uh, roads to maintain it, and uh, that's the best way I know to how to handle your investment. So I'm anxious to do it. When will this likely to be done if we approve it? How uh, do it um, and your approval this fall, uh, early fall? The um, although we're we're Rolling Meadows based, Chicago based. We have crews working throughout the United States and Canada. We will be having crew come in to a number of uh, local area projects. We did one earlier this spring. We're going to do uh, another one probably in another month or so, starting with Lake County, Arlington Heights. Um, there's a number of them. Okay, great. Well, I think it's uh, an important planning tool, so I certainly support it from my point of view. It worked out well last time, and I think it's going to be better this time. Was the uh, video different than last time? I don't recall. The, the video is different. It's, it was in standard definition last time. Uh, HD cameras were just coming out, and so now uh, now they're all high-definition images. So, Yeah, th I think I remember some upgrades. I mean, five years yeah. is a long time, but... Yeah. Impressive. So I assume software has up, been upgraded too in terms of the way deliverables are. Okay, thank you. Keep I in mind this very valuable, I'm sorry, valuable information. We, we budget $2 million a year for payment resurfacing. This is a five year evaluation tool, you know, in essence. This data is helping drive a $10 million budget for the next five years if approved by the board. So I just wanted to add that because you did mention the increase in the budget related to that. So thank you, Trustee Lane. Just to add on to that, I think it, I know it, it was a great um, thing to have that uh, 2011 when we did this, it was a great tool for you, Alan. And I think the other thing is too, is identifies these roads without s assuming that newer roads and d that were put in in more recent years are in better shape than older roads because it's not necessarily the case depending on a lot of other factors. So I like the idea that it's um, going to be a tool that you can really, really do some planning with. So I'm in support of it. I guess I'll ask what might sound like a stupid question. Um, but based upon your survey, it showed 79, which ranked, you said, very high as far as the current condition five years ago. So based upon that, knowing that our roads are in pretty good shape, is this something that we really need in the village? Well, if, I think if you're going to maintain them at that, at that level or, or hope to at or near that level, um, this is very, very important. If, if without pavement management, uh, you're, you're maintaining your roads in a crisis management mode. You kind of have to wait until they fail. In this case, you can, you can preempt that. You can see where you are, what you need to spend, and, and have a nice planned approach. You can also see the consequences of not doing it. You know, I mean, not doing anything to a road, how it's going to deteriorate. Alan or Scott, um, based upon what we learned last time, five years ago, I guess there was obviously some that had higher rankings than others. What percentage of those that we identified five years ago that we thought were important to complete would you say we have completed? I, I don't have a exact number uh, right off the top of my head, but, but uh, what I can tell you is uh, back in uh, 2011, we had an overall uh, rating of 79. Um, based on what we've done 
since then, uh, since 2011. Every year we input the work we've actually done into the PayPro, PayPro software module and it gives us, it actually gives us an updated ranking on where our, what it um, predicts our ranking is currently. So currently our roadway network rates out at an 80 based on the assumptions and predictions within the program. So that, that, that's actually another reason why it's really important to get an, a fresh set, set of data after five years to verify if these assumptions are correct as far as what the uh, pay pro management software is predicting. So um, according to the software, we're doing a pretty good job keeping up, but uh, we would like to get the verification from the uh, field data to uh, confirm that. Sounds like an excellent job keeping up. I guess where I was going was it, so if say it's 100% of what we wanted to get done and 40% or 60% of that's completed, if we have another 40 or 60 that left that we'd like to complete, do we need the additional data today to be able to go out and finish that completion? That's kind of where I was going with that. Does that make any sense? It does. Um, and the, the more data we have, the better informed decisions we can make. Um, we can make decisions based on the older data, um, but, uh, you know, from an engineering perspective, we want to make sure we can uh, make the best decisions and the most efficient use of mo our money here, and that would be by investing in uh, s some new data here to, uh, to guide us forward. I guess I'll ask because I haven't seen it. Is there generally roughly, without giving a specific, but a ballpark figure of what this is going to cost the village? What we did last time around uh, yeah, with a collection survey on the arterial uh, right around full deflection. And we did the full deflection last time? No. No? Well, for the level of detail, and since we were a new community, um, it, it was around $100,000, if my memory serves correctly. Um, but keep in mind that if, if you were to go out, since this is such a specialized firm and such a unique firm <coughs> with the best equipment uh, out there, that if you were to approach Baxter and Woodman, Burke, CMT, any of these consulting firms, they would hire IMS to do that work for you. So, um, you know, the, the level of detail, we can always talk about that. It's, it's kind of like buying a car directly from the factory and negotiating what you want as far as options are concerned. We can sit down and talk about that. My estimate is it's going to be somewhere between seventy dollars and $120,000, depending on the options that are selected. And we'd talk about that internally, staff-wise, to see, you know, what makes sense to drive our, our budget for the next, to do a good job to drive our $10 million budget for the next five years. So I, it's a valid question, it really is, but I, I think that's a ballpark uh, we're in. Is that correct? Uh, last question or comment I guess I had is, I know we were mentioned sidewalks and they're not gonna be included. I guess I would ask for consideration of maybe um, including curbs because I know when we go through the different subdivisions we're kind of leaving up to the homeowners to necessarily call and a lot of them don't understand or know that they should do that so they don't take it upon themselves and I have an example where I live that some of people called and they knew they got their curbs fixed the streets were done there's a number of curbs in the same street even that are just crumbling apart so it seems to me maybe it would make sense, and again, this is just my thought, if we're going to upgrade our, our infrastructure with the new pavement and some new curbs, if there's other ones that need to do it, maybe we could just plan on doing all those at the same time, that's all. Thank you. I have a few comments. Um, I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to pretend to be an engineer. Um, 
I do, however, manage and have managed several million dollars worth of projects in the private sector as a business owner. And my only statements really then for staff, as well as our guests here tonight, are um, if this service is going to pay for itself, it's going to provide better transportation for our residents, which is one of the most common comments we do have from the public. I'm all in favor of it. Now, based on the, the presentation that you made, there are some different variables in the pavement that we may not see where it's degrading in quality, where it may cost us exponentially more money to replace it if we don't catch it early with your technology. So, in essence, from the presentation, what I'm gathering is that your service can, may, and maybe Alan and um, Scott can chime in, shall pay for itself. And this is your field. Um, we have a great village administrator and staff, and I, I, I trust you with this project. So if it's going to meet that criteria, let, let's do it. Those are my comments. And if you want to add into how it can pay for itself, great. Or if and when it does late, at a later date, I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Well, I'll, uh, I'll answer that uh, somewhat briefly here. But um, I know that uh, Dave, I believe, had shown a chart where it had a steep drop off um, on pavement condition from where it um, cost one dollar it costs one dollar now versus eight dollars down the road uh, our goal is to catch that pavement in the one dollar area before it gets to the eight dollar area and if, if we can do that and um, I guess uh, from the last five years I think we've done a pretty good job of catching and identifying the areas that are starting to slide into the um, fair to poor area um, and if we can catch those before they get too bad and, and, repa and resurface them versus rebuild or reconstruct them, I think the service does pay for itself. Old, thank you. And uh, I, I did want to add one more thing. Um, this uh, pavement condition survey is also uh, motor fuel tax eligible, so we could um, utilize motor fuel tax funds to, to pay for this, um, for this service. Thank you both for your expertise and our guests as well for coming here tonight and providing the information for the board and the public. Thank you. Are there any other comments? But Ms. Pleckham, how, how does this help you with the planning for the next couple of years? Is this invaluable to you, this, this kind of service? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, when we had this in 2011, I think actually the number was three to four million a year that they recommended that we put towards the roadway improvement. So staff got back and recommended what we felt we could afford for lack of a better term um, and then from that point based on the condition of the road um, Alan and his crew determined which roads make the most sense the other part of this is the good news is that we're at 79 but the bad news is that we're at 79 so these newer roads are going to become older at the same time so some of those resurfacing efforts need to happen maybe a little more in advance once we get those roads that aren't so good and also, um, my opinion is that some of the roadways deteriorate different levels based on what Trustee Benucci had mentioned, the traffic volume and the weight of the cars on the roads and things of that nature, and also the weather conditions. So having it refreshed every five years makes a lot of sense. And also, because we have such a large group of good roads, we probably need to keep a little more on task as to which ones may be failing sooner, trying to stagger some of those costs along each fiscal year so we can better update those roadway systems. So yeah, it does, it does help. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have just a, a minor comment. Uh, it's obvious, uh, I'm not for vain repetition, I'm not gonna repeat your program, but uh, you know, the, the real strength of this uh, particular program is visual inspection is not very penetrating and it's not meant to uh, uh, be anything other than that. Uh, I think what you had mentioned earlier, uh, pavement management versus crisis management. I think this particular board and our, our administration works on management, not crisis management. And uh, the delivery of your data is very active for us to be able to be very positive, very forward, and find out what is truly wrong instead of guessing. And so uh, I support the program. It seems uh, very positive in uh, my eyes. Thank you. There aren't any other questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Persons, I think you're planning on bringing this forward uh, possibly as early as Monday, depending on. As early as Monday. Um, we, we can work through that. Uh, we'll be in contact uh, with this uh, professional service uh, group. 
and uh, it will be back uh, at, at the next available board meeting. Thank you. Next item. Next item on the agenda is downtown parking. Uh, just a really quick overview, and I'm going to have Baxter and Woodman approach the podium, the village's engineer. Derek Wald is here uh, this evening. You're very familiar with Derek. He's been to many, many meetings over many years. Uh, I mean that in the nicest possible way, Derek. Uh, Brent Pendry, who may be new uh, to the boardroom here, is here as well. And that, in essence, uh, the downtown parking did come up in several different meetings that we had as part of strategic plan and, and really as part of the community plan over the high school, too, as well. There were several people that expressed uh, the, the need for additional parking downtown. Tonight, uh, what uh, not only is that identified in the strategic plan, Baxter and Woodman's going to suggest how they would approach uh, this, this study in, in uh, kind of the way that they look at it. Uh, they'll talk about a couple of public improvement projects that have gone very well. We have done some nice parking improvements downtown, too, as well. But most of all, they'd like the input from the board. What would the board like to see in this study? And ultimately, uh, what are our goals uh, for the future, too, as well? So this is an open session. They're going to uh, give a presentation about five to ten minutes. There's only about six slides. And then after that, feel free to answer any questions or definitely provide some suggestions uh, for direction related to this study. So with that, I'll turn it over to Derek. Thank, good evening. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we do have a brief presentation tonight on a, a parking study for the village uh, downtown area. Uh, we're going to describe what goes into that study, um, present some examples of projects that have been completed in the, in, the, in the village, but really look for your input tonight on what you'd like to see out of the study. Um, the, as Alan mentioned, the strategic plan uh, noted as an action item to improve parking access for people visiting downtown businesses and restaurants. Uh, and the goals and objectives for 2016-2017 uh, fiscal year were to, one, conduct a comprehensive survey identifying parking utilization, and, and Brent here uh, with me tonight will talk about that. Uh, complete a report summarizing the parking data that's collected will generate a lot of information uh, while we're doing the, uh, the survey. And then finally, develop cost estimates for future parking improvement and that's where we'll look for some input as well on, on what type of parking improvements and uh, and costs um, and then again the local input was that um, there is a desire for additional parking in the downtown area uh, so with that I'll turn it over to Brent to give the the rest of the presentation uh, thank you uh, this slide shows the general downtown area currently perceived to have the uh, highest demand for parking um, if you go to the next slide. Um, as part of our uh, study, we'd be looking at the parking inventory. So we'd be inventorying the, uh, all of the existing parking spaces uh, downtown, including both off-street and on-street locations, and then categorizing them by public or private use. Um, to complete the parking utilization, we'll need to survey, um, do a, complete a field survey to determine the number of parking spaces being utilized. Um, this field survey would be completed every hour over the course of 12 hours, presumably 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for seven days. Um, the results of this survey would then be compiled to determine the, park, to determine the parking utilization rates. Um, both the existing parking conditions and the parking utilization would then be summarized in a technical memorandum. As far as the potential parking improvements, we would develop a parking concept for several locations chosen by the village. Um, as part of these concepts, uh, we would prepare a planning level estimate of construction cost, uh, consider any major drainage considerations, and approximate the uh, number of potential parking spaces. And then I just kind of want to briefly go over um, a couple projects that Baxter and Woodman worked with the village um, in designing and that were eventually constructed in the year 2013. Uh, this slide shows the expansion of the Displane Street parking lot. And then this is the construction of the Plainfield Public Library parking lot. Uh, we improved access and improved the configuration of the overall lot as well. And then I guess at this time we're looking uh, to the board for any input on the limits of the survey or any of the scope we've presented here tonight. I have a couple comments and this may be the answer may come partially from staff as well as coordinate with you 
we have different site plan reviews that we approve um, in the downtown area that many times um, different parking areas, whether they're public or private, are attached to those site plan reviews. So what I would be interested in is if this can be included in this, those site plan reviews and those parking lots that are in those parking spaces that are attached, um, I'd like to be able to see what can go and what can't go if we are looking at making changes downtown. And maybe this question then moves over to staff. What is to stop a private property owner from developing land that is currently holding on the parking spots that we based our site plan reviews and approved in the past on those spots? All, all very good questions. Um, actually, when we were having the, this, these conversations with Baxter and Woodman, we looked at it as well from a uh, the point of view that the uh, trolley barn is coming online. There is the uh, new restaurant going in uh, at uh, Illinois and, and um, Lockport Street, the uh, steakhouse, and uh, also just other various po potential changes. What would those potential demands and changes look like and its impact on, on the area? So the question you're asking, we, we kind of asked it in a slightly different way, but e exactly to your point, which is, you know, as the downtown continues to develop into a uh, entertainment center the way that it is, how do we uh, and where do we find the uh, the demand for parking? So It'll that's all something that I'll turn it over to Derek to kind of explain how that would work out besides yeah. doing the inventory alone. Yeah, ex exactly. We, we would work with staff, and actually we did work with the planning department with, uh, with Jonathan on um, kind of scoping out this project. So we would be... Uh, in close collaboration uh, with them on exactly what potential developments would be coming in or have been talked about in town and how they might impact some of the recommendations we're making. So I think it would just be a close um, you know, collaboration between us and staff to once we get the parking utilization rates now, look at potential developments that we're aware of and make sure those are incorporated into whatever recommendations we make. That's a, that's a good comment. Thank you. Yeah, it's clear that uh, this is not a uh, shopping mall with a big parking lot. We've got a downtown which is uh, very valuable. Uh, people are used to walking some distance in a parking lot to get to a big box type store. We probably ought to need to take a look at uh, the spaces we have, to how far they are from, say, Lockport Street, maybe use that as a benchmark. How many, how many within 500 feet of uh, downtown or whatever? Uh, and look at that because it's a unique situation. I think we want to maintain our downtown, historic downtown. It's unique. People love to come to it. Uh, they're not used to walking because usually you go someplace, you, you got your car and you can see where you're going. Well, here they got to get around the corner and maybe get to where they're going. So uh, more information you can provide on that, uh, distances and so on for the parking area would help. The other thing I would mention is the cruise night uh, write-ups suggest you don't do cruise night because it takes away some of the parking places. Well, an awful lot of people show up for cruise night. Where the heck are they parking? They don't mind walking from wherever they're parking. I think some of them are parking over here on the riverfront property. Uh, and so let's, let's document that too because that may give us some clues what people are willing to do if they really want to get someplace. So, but I think the study would be very useful. We've needed some good hard data. The last study was done Eight, nine years ago, maybe? Look at Michael Lambert, but I, it's done quite a while ago. So this would be very useful to have. Let's put some realism into it. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, so yeah, the last study was was almost 10 years ago, and, and I think the cruise nights is a good comment. I don't know that we'd be able to get the video recording that we're going to have just because of the mobility down there. We'll do our best in that part of it, but I, I definitely think it does need to be covered. You're right during that time period because there is heavy use. That's a good comment. I think um, one of the things, and, and I know this is just in the beginning planning stages, but in, in our report here that you provided, there were a couple of mentions of um, some areas that were something like going by Vista Lane over there, and I, even though there's a little park, the electric park is there, I, I don't know how parking and like that type of so much of a residential would be, would be welcomed by the people that live there because all of a sudden you're on this quiet street 
and then you know everyone's there parking so things like that I think are going to have a great impact as well we have to be cognizant of the the homeowners that are around as well is trying to find the parking so I, it's it's going to be a difficult balance to try to find some things but I think there's some ways that we can work through this and to um, the trustees point that that possibly um, working with some of the people that own the private lots or whatever might be more willing to you know work with the village on that in your uh, potential parking improvements there's a little 3.2 is a parking garage concept quite often when I talk to people in the community they, they express the desire for a parking garage but yet we don't know yet where to put it and there's really no cost I can spit out um, as far as on this small lot this is feasible because everybody says oh put it on the corner the, the green corner on the corner of Lockport and 59 well I don't even know if it's available to, for um, <coughs> for cars to go up if it's that small of a property or uh, what I'd like you to, to do is look at a couple different properties say government owned properties or, or a school district or a fire department or possible areas for a parking garage downtown and to just come up with like a ballpark figure so at least we have some gauge to tell people well do you really want to spend 10 million or 15 million or whatever the, the number is on a project sure that makes a lot of sense yeah we'll look at some different uh options for the garages and give you ballpark estimates on where they can fit or maybe where they're not feasible the right. property isn't big enough and and we'll come back with that that'd be great thank you you know, uh, Derek, I think it's really important in this uh, particular study and anything that the village board does uh, that we have to take the stakeholders into consideration. Anybody who owns property down in our uh, village of Plainfield, residential or business, if someone lives there and they have an interest, I think we have to have so an outreach where we hear from everyone, not just the village board. And I would uh, think that would be uh, a strong consideration, not only for us, but also for you to uh, take that into consideration. Thank you. I guess I'll ask again. I don't, I don't see a, a price. What's your cost for doing this? Can we not take that, Alan? Well, I think it really depends on the comments from the board this evening, too, as well. This is, we, we can approach it as a, a time and material uh, type estimate uh, related to the work I know that they uh, Baxter has some ideas of how long it would take the staff uh, to uh, evaluate the parking seven days a week for uh, most of the day I know the intent in the summer Baxter and Woodman they hire interns college interns and it reduces the cost so that was the idea so a cost for an intern would be considerably less than one of the engineering individuals. but just like the question on the related to the parking uh, garage we don't currently have a location in mind but I think it's important for the board to know for future budgeting the magnitude of scale related to that too as well so tonight we'll gather the information from the board we can come up with a, a round number as far as an estimate um, but it's it's probably going to be more leaning towards time and material at the at the regular rate that's charged by the village engineer I'll take any feedback related to that uh, too uh, as well yes one of the big reasons I was asking is I, I think, you know, part of this indicates that the business owners down, downtown think they need it. I don't know if there's anybody on this board that would say more parking wouldn't be a better thing. I don't know that we, what I'm concerned about is we're going to spend money to tell us things maybe we already know. In other words, we could always use more parking. The question, I think the bigger question comes where and how do we pay for it? And I don't know if necessarily this survey is going to address those issues. <laughs> if it is, great. But otherwise, my feeling is kind of can we save the money from the survey and focus more on how and where? That's my thought. I, I think the intent of the survey is to, first of all, answer the question of, of how much. Uh, I think right now it's just really hard to determine how many additional spots are needed. So I think the first thing is to come with some recommendations on maybe levels of additional service that are provided. Um, with parking and then from that point we can say the size and how much so I, I guess to, to answer your, your question um, I think that is a, a big part of it is to uh, determine where they could go and how much it would cost but I think the first thing is just how many spots are we providing and maybe different levels of service would be the way to do that will you give me a ballpark number for the study yeah yeah it's about 400 hours of work to do the parking count so that's the 12 hours a day uh, for seven days a week so that's roughly in the ballpark of thirty thirty five thousand dollars 
and then depending on what we include in the actual analysis, it's probably in the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar ballpark. So plus or minus fifty thousand dollars. Thank you. You know, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes we uh, use cost and savings as a prerequisite for an action. Uh, often, you know, what I, I think of, I have recently spoken with a number of individuals who want to invest in the village of Plainfield. And you know, one of the very first questions is, if I do buy something downtown, if I do build and invest here, where are people going to park? And you know the answer is, I don't know, they park on the street. The idea is for us to have a plan, uh, an obvious plan, because if you don't know where we're going without a plan, you're really going to flounder. And uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's very valuable for us to know what direction we're going to go. And cost, I know it's a, a valuable situation. We always try and uh, minimize uh, the governmental expenses on our taxpayers, but you still have to have a plan. I wouldn't build a building without an architect. I wouldn't do professional work without professional opinions. And so, um, what I'm saying is we need professional opinions to give us direction. We can't simply stand there and say, well, I think we ought to get some good opinion and act on it, take the data and work on it. Thank you. Uh, one of the things we're trying to get is actual real data as to how much of the parking is utilized. Now we're talking about doing it every hour you know, for a 12-hour period or whatever it is. Uh, we've done studies in the past, and I've heard a number of them, that, and the parking has not been that heavily utilized. There's always been empty spaces. Well, I think we're going to document that more precisely. Instead of having opinions around it, we'll actually have some facts and a very systematic way to collect the information. You're doing it for a full week, captures uh, a lot of stuff. It's not going to be typical of every week in the year, but it's certainly a good starting point. It's something we've not had before. We count the total number of spaces and we say, I don't think it's been that full very often. Well, you know, how meaningful is that? Let's get some solid data and it's worth uh, having a starting point. I think that's what we're talking about. Just to go on what Trustee Rasich had said, I agree 100%. And what I would like to see happen uh, as we follow through with this process is that not one person in this room can say after this process is done, Here's what we did with the study. It, it's in a file cabinet. That's not the answer that we're going to be able to give to anybody. I would love to see different action items, decisions that we can make as the board, uh, ones that we can involve the public on, as another trustee had mentioned, and be able to say, here's what we did with the 50000 what what have you, dollar, taxpayer dollars that we spent on this study. Here's the decisions we made. Here's the options we had. We involved the community, and here's where we went with it. So if we have a clear plan in place to have, you know, if staff can facilitate that with the board and say, here's the data we gathered, and here's where we're going to go with it. Here's five or however many decisions that the board's going to make now involving the public with the data that we accumulated, great. If that cannot be done, if it's going to be a study that's going to go in the file cabinet, uh, that's not something I would be in favor of. But that's not the direction it looks like it's going to go. And I'm definitely in favor of taking this and looking and seeing what is going on with parking and what different improvements we can make and approximate pricing so we can tell the public then what our options are with different um, parking uh, infrastructure upgrades as another trustee had mentioned as well because that has been a common question at different public meetings so that's that's it those are my comments thank you is in the strategic plan at the moment yes it is and we will get the continuing effort on it so yes we will Are there any other comments? One last thing. Can you look into the possibility? I know there's a lot of parking apps that they have, um, the Spot Heroes, and there's there's a whole bunch of different ones. If it's even feasible to have anything like that done out here where somebody could pull it up on their phone and go, oh, there's a spot a block away. Yeah, they have parking apps. Yeah, yeah so I've used those downtown I don't Chicago. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah in I've Chicago. I don't know if it's if it's possible to bring it out this way or, or what. It's just to look at it. Yeah. Definitely look into. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that uh, um, we've looked into for – um, something of, of, of this scale, I guess, and you like Derek said, something where you see downtown, but it's definitely something we could look into and see if there's a way to integrate it um, into this project. Yeah, it's just something different. I mean, use it downtown. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Persons will uh, work with uh, Derek and have a proposal possibly this Monday, more than likely the following uh, board meeting. 
uh, for your consideration. Reminders. <coughs> August 1st is our next uh, village board meeting. The second will be the planning commission and the eighth will be our next committee of the whole. We're seeking a motion to adjourn to executive session as permitted under the Open Meetings Act under Section 2C1 to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of employees or legal counsel not to reconvene. My motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Trustee Rasich? Yes. Trustee Wachowski? Yes. Trustee Benucci? Yes. Trustee Lamb? Yes. Trustee O'Rourke? Yes. Trustee Peck? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries.